Now that you've learned about vectors and two-dimensional motion, it's time to talk about relative motion and frames of reference, two important and fun ideas in physics. Whenever we describe the motion of an object, we are describing that motion from a particular frame of reference, or point of view. Let's take the escalator as an example. If you stand on this escalator and ride up to the next floor, you're not moving in the frame of reference of the escalator, but someone standing on the ground watching you would say that you are moving. Turning this idea around, here I am standing at the base of the escalator, and in this frame of reference, the books and shelves and things are not moving. Now I step onto the escalator, and you can see that the stuff that was stationary appears to be moving down and to the right relative to my new vantage point on the escalator. When you change frames of reference, your perception of how things are moving will change. Here's another example demonstrating the idea of a changing frame of reference that's kind of fun. This is a clip of a ball dropping taken with my phone. I slowed it down a bit, but from this perspective or frame of reference, the ball is clearly accelerating toward the ground. Here's a second movie of a ball dropping, but this time I dropped my phone at the same moment I released the ball so they fell together. Notice how from the frame of reference of the falling phone, the ball is stationary. Once again, the perception of the motion of an object depends upon the frame of reference of the observer. Here's yet another example demonstrating the idea of changing frames of reference. Have you ever been a passenger in a car and looked at the car next to you as your car starts to pull forward and thought, am I going forward or are they going backward? Sometimes it's hard to tell what's going on until you get your bearings by looking at the rest of the landscape. That confusion happens because the physical sensations of you moving forward and the other car moving backward are so similar. The truly amazing thing is that the laws of physics are the same in all non-accelerating frames of reference. That means it's very difficult, in fact impossible, for anyone to determine the speed of their own frame of reference if it's not accelerating. Almost everything is accelerating a little bit. If the car you are in bounces up and down just a little as it moves, it's accelerating a little bit. But if you went into deep space and didn't have the ground to look at, you might have a seriously hard time determining what's happening. Imagine cruising along in deep space with engines off so the ride is very smooth, and now imagine waking up from a nap and seeing a space llama corn in the distance. As the llama corn and the ship get closer together, it might be rather difficult to decide whether the relative motion between the two objects is the result of the ship moving toward the llama corn, or the ship and the llama corn both moving toward each other, or the llama corn moving toward the ship. In fact, the answer depends upon the frame of reference that's chosen. When we say that motion is relative, we are saying that the motion we perceive depends upon the frame of reference we perceive it from. Scientists used to believe that there must be some absolute stationary frame of reference, and if they could just find it, all motion could be measured relative to that. The Earth wouldn't work as the stationary frame because, although the ground may seem to be stationary, the Earth is rotating once every 24 hours. That works out to a speed of about 460 meters per second at the equator, and you can do a calculation to see how fast it is at your location. So the surface of Earth is not a good choice for the stationary frame of reference. Nevertheless, scientists theorized that there was some stationary stuff in the universe that was referred to as the luminiferous ether. And many experiments were conducted to try to detect the Earth's motion through this ether. The first experiment providing major evidence that the ether does not exist was done in 1887, and it's called the Michelson-Morley experiment. Here's the interferometer they used for the experiment. It doesn't look like much, but it was good enough to win Michelson the Nobel Prize in 1907. If you want to learn more about the history of the search for the luminiferous ether, you can just do an internet search for Michelson and Morley. But to make a long story short, after searching for the ether for a couple of decades, scientists accepted that it just doesn't exist. And the idea that no frame of reference is better than another and that all motion is relative ultimately led Einstein to develop his theory of special relativity, which is another interesting topic that you might like to look up. So where does all of this leave us? Well, once we have established that we can talk about motion from different points of view and that there's no reference frame that's better than all the others, the best we can do is to try to find a way to relate different frames of reference. And this takes me back to vectors. Let's use an example from ice hockey, one of my favorite sports. Imagine a goalie is standing stationary in their goal, watching the game unfold. I'm going to draw a little set of axes to show you the goalie's origin and coordinate system. This is the goalie's frame of reference. Skater 1 is located here, and from the goalie's frame of reference, Skater 1's velocity looks like this. Notice the subscripts I'm using here. I read that velocity as the velocity of Skater 1 according to the goalie. Skater 1 has a different frame of reference, and so I'm going to give her her own set of axes. Her frame of reference moves along with her, so the velocity of that second set of axes would also be v1, g. A second skater is located here, and from the goalie's perspective, her velocity looks like this. 
The question I would like to answer is, what is the velocity of skater 2 from the frame of reference of skater 1? The first step in answering that question is to relate some positions. According to the goalie, player 1's frame of reference is here, and player 2's position is here. And this is the position of player 2 from the frame of reference of player 1. The relationship between these vectors is r1g plus r21 is equal to r2g. Now I'm going to do a trick, and that is to differentiate this equation. That just amounts to differentiating each vector, and since the derivative of position with respect to time is velocity, I end up with v1g plus v21 is equal to v2g. That equation is going to be very useful, but before I get to that, let me just point out that you can differentiate again and get an equation that relates accelerations, a1g plus a21 is equal to a2g. Now let's focus on the velocity equation. I know v1g and v2g, and I want to learn about the velocity of skater 2 from the frame of reference of skater 1, so I'm going to rearrange the equation. That's my answer, and in graphical terms, v2g minus v1g looks like this. So that's the velocity of skater 2 according to skater 1. If I had the vectors written in their component forms, I could also do that calculation. You can also check to make sure that this answer makes sense conceptually. If you look at the x component of the velocity of skater 1, you can see that it's just a little bit bigger than the velocity of skater 2. So from skater 1's perspective, skater 2 is drifting slowly in the negative x direction. Here's the y component of skater 1's motion, and skater 2 has no y component in that reference frame. So from the perspective of skater 1, skater 2 should appear to be moving in the negative y direction compared to skater 1. Conceptually, vector 2, 1 certainly seems to fit with the description that we just made, so it looks like this is the right answer. This vector formulation may seem like a lot of effort to solve a problem that you might have been able to solve with intuition, and maybe it was. A lot of times you can sort out problems involving two frames of reference with your intuition, and maybe that should even be the first thing you try. But sometimes it can be helpful to fall back on this method if things get confusing, and you can also use it to check your intuition. As you try some frame of reference problems, I would encourage you to approach the problems both formally, using vectors, and informally, using your intuition. You really want to have the formal method at your disposal, so it's good to practice it, but you don't want to rely upon it so much that you lose track of what's really going on.